Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you're listening to Revive Thoughts. All right, everybody, it's time for another Revived Conversation. And this is a a type of episode where Troy and I talk about something related to church history and how uh, it could apply to us today. And, uh, you know, in, in several of our conversations, when we're analyzing these people from history, their lives, uh, we'll often talk a little bit about their marriage and if it was good or or bad. Yeah, we we put forth our opinions on on whether we think that they were good at at being a parent or being a husband or or what that marriage looked like. And it's very clear that some people do it really well, and some people do it very poorly. And the sad thing is, I feel like I see it happening poorly more than I feel like it should. It, it's it seems that it's there is somewhat of a correlation there between people that are devoted to ministry and it having a bad marriage life at home. Like it's it's hard to run a a, a, a passionate ministry and a healthy family at home at the same time. Seem, seems to be the correlation that you could extract. And you know, I would even say that from my personal uh, relationships with the people around me, you know, the, I have a lot of pastor friends and you can you can see how that ministry affects their home life. And I think there is layers to that, whether that's um, some people's personalities, you know, is there a personality level to that where some people are better at juggling and categorizing and maintaining and going with the flow and managing that home life as well as ministry at the same time. Um, And obviously also a spiritual level to it. You know, we, we talk about the fruits of the spirit. We talk about uh, the structure of the church and of marriage and how we're supposed to bring God into that marriage and, and the structure that God gives us to do that. And that's helped by the Holy Spirit. And so does a poor marriage mean that you're not a good Christian? You know, like, are these people not as spiritual as we give them credit to? You know, are, are we are we looking at their marriage as evidence of what their spiritual walk must have been like? Is that a fair assumption, a fair uh, correlation to make there? All very interesting questions. Uh, Troy, you've been doing reading. I've been hearing you talk about, you, yeah. you've been digging, digging through books, reading about the marriages of, of Countless well, not, men. not quite that thorough. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't give me too much credit here. Um, but yeah, I've been looking at some different things. And it's kind of funny that you say, you actually mentioned a second ago, you know, should we count a person's marriage as something, as evidence of their walk with God or their ministry? And it's funny because when we look at church history, we know some of these guys will mention had bad marriages and we kind of excuse that and we go, oh, you know, look, don't look too much into that. Look at all the good he did. But the irony is, if in our own day, you know, take a famous example of a pastor, whoever you, you know, you look up to, someone as big as a pastor that you go, I like sermons by this guy. And if he were to suddenly have a big divorce or something, that would be huge, right? That would probably be a really big deal to everybody. uh, And it would affect how you view his ministry. Yet, if the guy has been dead for 200 years, we tend to look at it differently. I think that's a little interesting. Not that it means that, oh, they have a divorce, so they had something go wrong in their marriage. That's a sign that we should immediately assume the worst. But it, but we let's not give, you know, let's not not take it, that into account as well. It should be important. Now, some of these things, though, um, some of them surprise me. So let me give an example of one that kind of maybe surprised me. Maybe it shouldn't have. Uh, but Jonathan Edwards, you know, Joel, if you were to mm-hmm. if you were to put Jonathan Edwards, if you were to start, just give me some descriptor words of Jonathan Edwards. What would they be? Um, may picture them in your head. American that, Revival. There you go, American yeah. Revival. But if your personality, gotcha. you know, put picture that that stern yeah. face in your mind. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, very stern, very uh, matter of fact. But he had a great marriage, right? He did. That's what I was going to say. So if you've never Google imaged Jonathan Edwards, you should, and you will get a very stern face looking guy. Yet he had many kids with his wife. Him and his wife got along really well, and they seemed to love each other and care for each other just absolutely deeply. And it was all positive, everything about it. In fact, they were so positive that George Whitfield, when he came to town, he saw the marriage they had. He saw the relationship and just this love that they had for one another. And he said, I want that. I want something like what Jonathan Edwards has. That's a good relationship. I want, He said he started praying, God, give me a wife like Jonathan Edwards had. 
And so there's a really positive story from a guy that's known for being stern and harsh. He would spend 13 hours a day, it said, in his book study, in his room studying. But his wife would come in and have conversations with him. They'd debate philosophy. They'd talk theology. They would just have a great time, and they loved each other so much. Other people wanted what they had. But then George Whitfield, who mm-hmm. prayed, God, give me a wife like Jonathan Edwards. He did not get a wife like Jonathan Edwards. He had a really interesting, in my opinion, story. He found a woman um, who was a widow, and she was really in love with another man. And this man was like a real handsome man's man, tough guy. Everyone thought he was great. His name was Hal Harris. But he thought, if I, if I marry her, I'll get distracted. I won't be able to focus on the ministry. And I've got too many, too many things going on. But he knew George Whitfield wanted to get married, which is funny because who would be busier than George Whitfield at the time? And George Whitfield was like, I super want to get married. And he's like, will you marry me, widow? And she's like, I kind of like this other guy. He's like, come on. And the other guy was like, I'm not going to marry you. You should go marry George Whitfield. And she's <laughs> like, all right, I'll marry George Whitfield, I guess. And George Whitfield was like, yeah, cool, great. But he also, he admitted either in it, I can't, don't know if he said it to her, but he admitted his own diary and stuff. I don't find her attractive physically. This is not a very pretty woman. There are much prettier people, but that's okay. She has a great personality. Mm. And so it's all going to be great. Oh, it's like, it's oh, how all great know, marriages George. start. <laughs> it's like not, this is not looking good. And the thing was, he, he also earlier in his life, he said, I want to get married someday, but I'm committed to living my life like I don't plan to get married because Christ has to be so number one. And so when he did get married, he's like, I like this girl, but also I'm so committed to living mm-hmm. that way. I'm going to keep it going. And so he traveled and he wouldn't spend a lot of time with her. And they, they, they stayed married. They were okay. It, it worked out, but you could tell that they weren't mm-hmm. as happy. And he even said, I think something to the, I'm not I'm paraphrasing, but something to the effect of us like, I don't really do it on her. Like some men do with their wives. And it's like, uh, it doesn't sound good when you put that yeah. on paper. You know, I, I like her, but I'm not like, crazy almost, almost it's reminds like, me of like, uh, like, you know, Paul, when he's talking about marriage and he's like, I would like, if you guys are married, you should act like you're not. I mean, that's paraphrasing. And that's that's but... the, what Whitfield would kind of put down as a central doctrine. Right. But I feel like it played out in a way that it looked like you didn't like her that much um, and that you weren't really in there. And, and you compare that to Jonathan Edwards, mm-hmm. who had this real devoted wife and husband thing going on. And one of them made people go, wow, I want that. And one of them made them go, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, cool, man. That's kind of awkward. Not doesn't sound quite as good. Mm-hmm. And then if you're going with these stories, you kind of have to also tell John Wesley's who he got married. Um, and I don't remember the exact circumstances of why he got married. I, I haven't looked at it in a while, but his marriage was not not good at all. The first year he was like, "Hey, you're second to me. Christ is first. He traveled all over the country, and she went with him. And then after a year of eating not good food, basically on the road, sleeping under trees and stuff, she's like, "I'm gonna stay home and start a family and do all that." And I'm not going to travel with you anymore. And then from what I can tell, she hated that he was always gone traveling. And she was jealous because girls were always talking about how great Jonathan Edwards was, or John Wesley was. Now he was discipling people and stuff like that. And she didn't like that. And likewise, he didn't like her because he felt like she was holding him back for ministry. Mm-hmm. And so the two of them fought like crazy. There's an account of a man going to visit John Wesley. And when he opens the door to kind of go into the house, he sees John Wesley being dragged by his hair across the room by his wife. Oh my. Um, and, yeah, and at one point he said, hey, I'm going on a trip to tour to tour in Ireland to preach Christ, and if I never see your wicked face again, that would be okay. <laughs> um, on the day that they divorced, on the day that like he kind of divorced officially, she left him, and they did divorce, which back then didn't even happen that often. So it tells you how rough things are. On the day she left him, he was like, I am completely fine with that. I hope I never see her again. I never left her. She left me. I, no, there's no guilt on me for this, basically. Hmm. Um not great. So that was obviously a bad example of a marriage that didn't go very, um, very well at all. On the other side of it, Charles Wesley, he, he was thrilled. I was reading his account of getting married. It was like almost like a schoolboy, like kind of back in college days or something where he's like, I told John Wesley, John Wesley approved of the girl. And then I told, I told my friend George and George was so happy. Everyone was hearing about it. It was great. No, we couldn't wait. We got married. And then John was kind of a jerk during that here in that one too so apparently he wanted charles to put christ first so he scheduled like they were supposed to walk to the town where they were going to get married but he scheduled preaching tours and they scheduled so many engagements that he almost missed his own wedding and was late to it um and john did that to teach him like remember preaching comes first but charles took it more like hey yeah he wrote in his diary like i'm so mad at john for this like what a jerk like trying, i get trying the to trick him out of missing his own wedding or like or like to oh guilt him gosh. into it 
Yeah, and you gotta you gotta respect the commitment in some level, but also that's not the way you do it. And you can see how a guy with that mindset probably didn't have the best and happiest of marriages. Mm. And so there's just all these different perspectives. But you can see great men of God, men of God that many of us would respect if we could get an hour with them to ask, you know, go back in time and talk to them for an hour and get we'd have great answers to great questions. And yet we see them taking, you know, very different approaches to marriage very different marriage turnouts, very, they're just very different um, ways to view. And all three of these men were contemporaries. They lived at the same time. And yet we see through, you know, George, John and, and, uh, and Jonathan Edwards, very different results and very different marriages. And I think it's really hard. Like you said, when you're running a big ministry, but then again, none of us are running ministries the size of George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, or John Wesley. And yet I think it, it comes really down to what is your level of, you know, commitment and how important is this thing to you? On the one hand, your your spouse has to be somebody who comes first and is important to you and they have to take precedence in so many levels. But on the other side, Christ also has to come first even before that spouse. I think a good example is actually from the life of Charles Spurgeon, but not from Charles's perspective, but from Susanna Spurgeon. So when they were dating, kind of not dating because they didn't really date like we do, you know, and take her down to the sock hop or something like that. It wasn't quite like what's that. A, but when they were engaged, a sock hop. That's what, like in the fifties, like people would go to a dance and they called it the sock, the sock hop, hop for listeners. Yeah, they went disco before disco. Interesting. I've never heard that before. Is that true, listeners? I know some of you are older than I am. If you can write in and tell me, did I get that correct? Is that what a did sock I use hop sock hop right? I've never been to one, but. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, maybe it really was just that you had a you put a sock on the when ground. You hopped, you hopped yeah. over it. I mean, I that was that's, that's that's quite the dating activity, <laughs> hopping with socks. <laughs> but it was back then. It was older, is what I'm trying to say. It was before they really dated. David. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the Puritans and the new people of England and America were really the ones who pioneered the idea of let's get love for love's sake, especially in America, where there weren't these there weren't these attachments to noble families. There weren't these aristocratic families, and so it was really just like marry somebody you like. You know, just, just don't worry about all that stuff. Just go find someone. You were all out here in the colonies, you know, barely surviving on the frontier anyway. There's really no noble family. So don't worry about that. Just go find a girl or a guy and you're going to enjoy and go marry together. And I thought that was kind of an interesting aspect, too, because, again, we see the Puritans and we see these people as really stern, tough people. And yet they kind of pioneered the idea of marry for love mm-hmm. and not just because, you know, they have a nice dowry and they can, you know, when you marry them, you'll get a donkey, too. Uh, but Spur- back to Spurgeon, uh, Spurgeon goes, and he's on his way to a church. He has to preach. His fiance is there, is all excited. And then she can just tell Charles is not paying attention anymore and isn't listening to him. And he gets out of the carriage they're riding. He doesn't hold the door or anything for her. He doesn't do anything. He completely just kind of zones out. He's like sweaty. He's nervous. He just walks away and leaves her there. And she's like, how could he do this to me? She's upset. She's mad. She waits. She realizes he's not coming back. He's gone into the church. He's going to go preach. He's completely forgotten her. And in, a, in just a mat of fit, she's like, I can't believe him. She she tells the carriage rider, take me home. I'm not, I am, I've never been more upset with, you know, I, I imagine this is when she's like, Charles Hayden Spurgeon, you know, is a full name kind of situation, right? She is upset. And she gets home and she tells her mom what happened. And her mom looks at her and goes, hey, Charles has a gift. You love him. But his first devotion is Christ. And you've got to realize you come second to that. As important as you are to him, he loves Jesus the most. That's his calling. His gift is preaching. And you can't stand in the way of that. And she kind of was like, oh, is that what I was doing? Was I making myself more important? On some level, she must have thought so. And Charles, after he preaches, he kind of then comes out of his, you know, days or whatever he was in his, I don't say trance, it sounds weird, but he kind of regathers himself, realizes my, my girl's not here. Where is she? He like runs all the way to the house to see her. He's like sweaty. He's a mess. Like, what happened? Are you sick? Are you okay? And she's like, you know what? It was on me. This one's on me. You didn't do anything wrong. I was being selfish. And I think that's a really good picture of what in some ways a good marriage Mm -hmm. can be understanding that to these two people loved each other charles and Susanna have a well-known well-documented case of people who loved 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 each other even though they both would have regular sicknesses all the time both of them both felt bad that they couldn't be there for each other charles would struggle with depression at times she would struggle with her own illnesses they both felt like they weighed each other down and yet they both were shining examples of christ they both did great ministries and yet i think that picture of just 
I'm not going to get in the way of what this other person is doing for Christ. And I'm going to put my own selfish desires under them there. As soon as, as you know, if they're ignoring me for selfish reasons, that's not going to happen. But understanding that there are going to be times when that person is pursuing Christ and I need to kind of not let that selfishness get in the way. I think that's a really good picture of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. It's going to be impossible if, if the wife isn't also uh, being led by the spirit and, and ha has her own foundation, a strong spiritual foundation in that to, to help make that help make that work in the most optimal way possible, which is kind of what it sounds like you're describing there with Spurgeon. That's exactly, I think, what it is. Um, another example, this is kind of a short snippet, but sometimes the wife will also, I think, end up being the rock when hmm. the guy is having a hard time. Um, A.B. Simpson, who did a bunch of things for the Christian, Christian Missionary Alliance, kept wanting to go overseas and be a missionary to China. And he had a lot of struggles in different areas. And at one point, his wife uh, was asked, like, so are you going to be a missionary to China? And she's like, I'm not going to China with a lunatic. We're going to be right here doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing, and he's going to get this out of his head at some point. And not long afterwards, he was kind of like calmed down and was like, hey, your missionary fervor is great. You're not going to China. Also, your wife is not going with you, and so you're going to get it together. Uh, another example maybe of some, not, not even a very similar example, a very different example uh, is John G. Payton who he famously went to the New Hebrides Islands, which was full of cannibals. He knew that. And to go, for the most part, I mean, it's pretty much everyone thinks that he married his wife because mission organizations wanted you married at the time. And so he met his wife like a couple weeks before they left. They got married. They headed off to these islands together. And if you, you think if there was any recipe for a marriage not lasting, it would be that one. And the marriage didn't last, but not because of a divorce or anything. She died about a year after or so they got there. Um, but he loved her so much and they, they really bonded together. They even had a daughter together. Sadly, the daughter also did not make it. It might've been a son. I know they had a child and they didn't make it either. He had to bury both of them. And then horrifically, cause it was an Island of cannibals. He had to fight off the cannibals to keep them from eating her. A horrible, horrible situation, obviously. Yet John Payton will basically credit his wife's like, will say like those words of strength that she gave me as she was dying of illness, her encouragement to stay, stay strong for Christ for part of the reason I didn't lose my mind on that island because I kept remembering her love and remembering her, her just belief that I was going to do great things for this island. Um, he would eventually, I think, get remarried, have some kids, and things worked out for him later on. But those first couple of years were hard. And another example of maybe I of may, <laughs> maybe a missionary life not going so well, Adniram Judson had multiple wives when he was on the field and his second wife had to write the autobiography or not the autobiography, the biography for the first wife, um, which I always thought was kind of an awkward thing to ask yeah, your weird. second wife to do. It's weird. Like, hey, I love you. You're very sweet. Could you, <laughs> could you write the biography for wife number one? And don't worry, wife number three will write yours. And if I recall correctly, she did. Why? So, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's stuff like that in history where you read it and you go, what? You know, there's other examples too. Uh, famously, C.T. Studd. You know, you mentioned at the top of this episode, somebody who had a huge ministry. This guy had a huge, huge missionary ministry, yet he once went 15 years without seeing his wife, kind of saw her for a little while, went back out on the field. That's not a good, not a good marriage. Mm -hmm. And I would not say it's a shining example of one, although he was doing great things for ministry on the mission field. His wife wasn't with him while he did it, and I don't think they were very happy about it. David Livingston had a very similar story where he would go to Africa for years. Everyone would think he's dead. Then he'd show back up. He'd see his wife and his kids, um, and they had a great time for the most part, and then he'd kind of go back, and he'd do it again. He did lose one of his children. They went to um, America and ended up getting kind of pulled into the Civil War and died over there. Um, so, you know, not, I don't know that the marriages and families were always happy, especially for those 19th century missionaries. Uh, and then David did eventually convince his wife to go on a missionary journey with him. Um, but not long after she got there, she died. And so she really wasn't able to handle it medically. And he, he wasn't wrong to think that all that time. And so there's really sad aspects for some of the people we look up to, you know, so much like a David Livingston, these great people who did amazing things for God, um, helped end slavery and helped discover all these things and helped preach the gospel, all these people, but in some ways kind of did that, the sacrifice of their marriage. And Livingston really looked at it as like, my wife and I love each other. We wish we could be together, but we know this is a bigger calling. And so we're giving up that comfort for each other for this. On the other side of it, though, I think sometimes it's these guys will get caught up maybe chasing the glory. That's what um, John Sung said in China. He was preaching and going from city to city, and he just kind of 
didn't put his marriage and at the forefront. Eventually he kind of got sick and his wife had to take care of him. And he said, you know what, if I get better from this, I'm not doing that anymore. I think I really need to be home with the kids and home with you. I made a mistake making it all about, you know, the big preaching revivals and he did get better. And he actually did stay with his wife for a few more years and kind of, kind of tried to make amends realizing he had, he had done his wife wrong by leaving her out while he traveled and preached and that he wasn't, even though it's important to preach the gospel, that that shouldn't sacrifice your marriage in that process. So what's your takeaway from, from all of this? What, what's your, <laughs> what's your, yeah. What do you think? Man, that's tough. Um, I think my takeaway from all of this is I get two. Okay, actually, with two stories, that'll be my takeaway. I think these are the kind of two. If I can put two good mm-hmm. stories out there that I think give us insight. Famously, Martin Luther married Catherine Luther. Luther. Uh, they did so because they were just kind of sticking it to the Catholic Church. Also, uh, one was a nun, one was a monk. It was highly forbidden. And I didn't know this, but apparently, the Catholic Church really didn't have that big a problem with priests marrying. They they weren't supposed to. But on the like on the side, a lot of priests were getting were having families anyway, so they kind of looked the other way. But monks, monks were the guys who were not supposed to marry. And then the other side of it was, and nuns, nuns too. And then the other side of it was the Catholic Church had instituted a thing basically where if you have sex outside of marriage, but you secretly agree to get married, it counts, and you're married. And this would be okay even if you were a teenager. And so a lot of twelve and fourteen year olds were getting married secretly. You know, having or you know, we promise to God and then we have sex and then we get married and it's okay. But those are not good ways to start marriages. And guess what would happen is not long afterwards, these marriages would want to divorce. And to get a divorce, the Catholic Church had to get paid. And so basically, these kids were having these marriages. They weren't going well. They were kind of wrecking their lives and their future. And then they were having to pay the Catholic Church to dissolve these marriages. And Martin Luther was like, you guys have so messed up the institution of marriage. You created a problem, and then you're getting paid to solve the problem you created. And you're leaving this just massive wreckage of marriages behind. And so when the Protestant Reformation was happening, he was very sincere of, we want to make marriage different than the way the, Pro- the Catholics look at it. We want it to be important, binding, something that is really holy. Well, he marries this nun, and they don't get along. He doesn't find her attractive. She doesn't find him attractive. If you ever Googled a picture of Martin Luther, he's not the most handsome guy on the block you can see. So, you know, the attraction level there struggles. Uh, and they both kind of said, like, we're marrying to kind of stick it to the Catholic Church and because we need to marry for different reasons. This isn't really a marriage of love. But over, and they fought. They were known for not getting along. They were known for both being very fierce personalities. People liked them, but they were tough. I mean, if you've ever learned much about Martin Luther, you can imagine he's probably not the nicest guy. And he's a nice guy, but he's sharp. He has opinions. Imagine being married to him. And these two people struggled for years and years and years. But over time, things softened. Over time, Martin came to appreciate her as a mother and appreciate, you know, her ideas and her way of doing things. Catherine came to appreciate him as a leader. And over time, years and years and years, they came to start writing letters to each other in very much respectful ways, different ways than they used to. And by the end of their marriage, uh, Martin Luther would write letters to her when he's traveling. He would call her his empress. He said, I wouldn't trade you for any queen in Europe. You are my empress. And I love you with all my heart. I think he said, but one letter was something to the effect of like, no, there's no one who loves you as much as this monk, monk will love you. Things like that. And they had a really romantic relationship by the end of that marriage. But those early years were hard. And so I would say, you you may be looking into marriage. You may already be married. You may be going through a hard spot. If there's one thing we can learn in church history, There are people who had bad marriages and God still used them greatly. And also, just because your marriage is bad at one point doesn't mean it's stuck that way. Continue pressing on and continue turning to each other. You might find that that marriage gets better over time as you two learn to kind of soften off the sinful edges and the Mm -hmm. Lord uses that institution of marriage to grow you deeply. You too might have a Martha and Catherine story where at first it was pretty rough, but the Lord used it to be something really, really good. My second story is actually B.B. Warfield, who he has this crazy story of getting married, loving this girl, and he's going to going to Europe to learn and study. And the champion theory is that she got struck by lightning, but somehow they're in a big giant storm on a boat, and she has just a complete mental breakdown, and she gets sick, and she never fully recovers. She's sick for the rest of his days, and even though she gets better at different points, she's never fully herself, and by the end of her life, she's really, truly sick. And he has to spend all his free time 
caring for her and spending time with her to the point that he can't even leave Princeton's campus. He literally lives on the campus and only leaves the campus two times over the course of a decade because she's so ill and she requires such constant around-the-clock care. But he loved her so much. He was so daunting on her. He, he just every not daunting. He just so loved spending time with her, doing anything he could for her. She was his world. And she he was able to respond to people, write books, write articles, respond to things in real time because he had all the free time in the world because he had her to take care of and she needed lots of rest. So when she was resting, he could read books and articles and then write responses to them. He'd take his daily walk with Gerhardus Voss, but that was about all he would do. Uh, and that he God used that very sad situation and made it something good. It made him a really good example of just Christ loving his church. And it also allowed him to really become the famous name that B.B. Warfield would end up becoming because he had so much time. And so the other side of it is some people don't have like a rocky relationship, but there might be things in the marriage that maybe cause it to not, you know, you might be in, in restricted in different ways or something like that. You might be inhibited, but trust God, he might have a very good reason for that. And your marriage might, like, much like B.B. Warfield's, might be an example that people point to someday like, no, look at look how much these people loved each other. That's the kind of loving relationship that Christians can have. And so I think that those are my kind of two story examples to walk away mm -hmm. from. Uh, some of the greats have marriages that aren't so great. That doesn't mean that they weren't great, just might have been their personalities. Some of the greats had rough marriages at the start and they got better. And some of them were just that God put the right person in their life and they had a great marriage. And you could tell like Susanna Spurgeon or B.B. Warfield that they were just blessed to have each other. Mm -hmm. And that's just how it is. I think it's there's no one formula for it. There's no, if you know the secret to success, you're going to have it. Um, it ends up being different for everybody. Yeah, it's a very human variable in in our lives of of just living in a in a fallen world. We we have our natures and our personalities, and uh, you know, God calls us to something higher, and we're to strive for that higherness. But it just seems like something where, it, yeah, we are still human at the end of the day, and we all we we still have these personalities, and it's uh, our responsibility to try to make it work for. The kingdom and how we interact with with our spouses and and serve God at the same time. Yeah, I wish there were a like like a passage in the Bible that, that was like a, a a rule system as far as how to you know when your wife needs your attention and when your ministry needs your attention. How do you how do you triage that? How do you communicate with with your ministry and with your wife? That is often those scenarios, and I think realistically good communication is kind of at the crux of a lot of this like even if it's not the ideal result for the the marriage at that moment to to be focusing on the ministry um to at least be talking through and and effectively communicating where you're at and and why what your motivations what your thoughts are communicating your love for each other, even though uh, you're not able to see to that at that moment type of thing. You know, like your your classic marriage counselor line where communication is is king, right? You, <laughs> it, the, the more yeah. communication, the better. Um, I have found that to be at least true in my own limited way and observations. I, I think too, if there's one, if there's one key, if, you know, I said there was no one key, but if there was one thing I noticed is they're on the same page. Mm -hmm. The the ministries and relationships that seem to be good, if the guy is, you know, out preaching and doing these travels, the the better relationships are the woman understands that that is what he's doing and she's on the same page. You know, much like the Susanna Spurgeon saying like, "Hey, I'm I'm here to support him to not get in the way." And then also, if your man loves theology, you're reading theology books too. You're right there kind of going through that process with them, maybe not reading theology books, but you're showing interest in this aspect of their life. And I don't know that, that, that to some people that comes naturally, to some people it doesn't. But I think having that, you know, the, these relationships that really seem to shine brightly through church history, these two people both love to talk philosophy, theology. They had these things in common. They were sharing them. And so having that ability of saying, I'm interested in this. And, it, and maybe if you're not, as, as maybe you're just saying, you know what, I'm not as interested in this, but I know my husband is, so I'm going to jump mm -hmm. in. And likewise for the husbands, I, there are multiple examples. Susanna's virgin, um, Gerhardus Voss's wife uh, writes the children's study Bible, a uh, story Bible, not study Bible. Sorry, uh, th there are a lot of examples of the men supporting the women and the women having ministries and things they're doing too. They're writing books, or they're. I think G. Campbell Morgan's wife was another one. These they're doing stuff too. They're not just 
staying out to the side, but and not every wife wants to do these things. But mm-hmm. if they do, being men that kind of support them in that and saying, hey, you know, like Charles did to Susanna, hey, you wanted to help books get to people. You know, she had this desire. She's like, you know, you write a great book, but I wish pastors could read this book. And he says, if you wish that, go make it happen. And she goes, you know what? I will. I'm going to get 100 pastors your book this year. And she worked a little charity. And by the end of her life, I think she had helped get over like 10,000 books. I think it might even been higher than that. Donated to different pastors saying, hey, we help pastors who need money and need support get theological books. That became her ministry and her passion. And so the idea that, um, you know, the, the woman is not necessarily a doorstop or a doormat either. She has her own stuff. And I think the really great marriages are where both people are actively growing and doing things. And it might not be the exact same things, but they're, they have a lot going on. They're reading, they're involved with each other and they're just mutually building each other up. And they're really looking to each other and say, I want to see the best for you. And I want you to grow closer to God. Mm-hmm. And I want to do what helps you grow closer to God in that way. And they're just really, again, putting themselves second and putting Christ first, but recognizing that when my spouse is growing in Christ, that's great for everybody. So how can I do that mm-hmm. for her or him? And that that's all good and well. And I think that's obviously like in a perfect universe, like the the, the goal to align with. I think what really makes those good marriages great are when you do have a moment of weakness or you do have a moment of selfishness or you do have a moment of where you're not putting God first and, and you have that that selfish nature that creeps in on yourself. How the, the other spouse responds to that is is where it seems like a lot of the the good marriages, I mean, you're talking about, you know, thank goodness Spurgeon had her, or the, the wife of Spurgeon had her, was it her mother or her mother-in-law? I believe it was her mother. Her mother, yeah, or her mother there just to remind her. I mean, I, and obviously that's not Spurgeon doing that in that role in that time, but um, it is, I think it's naive to think that we won't have moments where we are losing sight of God's glory for for a moment. Now, not that that should be a case, and we should strive for, obviously, that maintained vision of God's glory, but I think God gives us strength and wisdom to deal with the situations where, yeah, where where your spouse may maybe isn't on the same page with you, and that's where I think a lot of the problems can occur as well. When, when they are being dumb and you don't handle that situation correctly, and that could you know, helps drive a bigger wedge between you and a bigger chasm. You know, there's there's the variables that could compound and go much worse are very vol- volatile during those times. And so kind of dealing with, yeah, non-ideal situations is where a lot of that, a lot of that strength and wisdom comes in, I feel like. Well, I feel like we gave several good stories from church history. We talked about different examples. I I will say it's it's kind of weird giving like uh, here's what church history says about marriage because then I'm like well you know it, does this make I don't I don't know that Joel and I are like marriage experts or um, have we have like PhDs in that or anything no. it's not nothing like that we're just talking about stories from church history that I think kind of encourage us and inspire us and are oh, interesting so far, so good. how long have from. you been married Roy? Well, we're over eight okay. years. I think it's nine years here in May. So ah. you know that's still in some ways early, but I feel like. We're not, you know, we're not the beginning days either. Yeah, we'll be we'll be eight years in June. So that's right. Yeah, I think I think I feel, I feel pretty good about that. I feel like I have a good <laughs> understanding of of what marriage life is like, and I'm I'm in on it for the long haul. I feel I'm not a uh, you know unsure of what I'm getting myself into. That's true. I just I I feel like I I, I hear I just don't want to somebody who's been married forty years be like these whippersnappers. Yeah, you don't know don't nothing even, yet. They don't even know how hard year twenty seven <laughs> can be. I don't I don't that's want to true. sit here and that's why I'm trying not to bring it into my marriage. Or here's what I do with my wife. Mm-hmm. You know, we're using these examples because you know we're still we're you know I'm under a decade. I can't I can't say for sure all the all the details of it, um, but I do know. Like you said, we're not we're not brand new to it either. We we've, we've been married a little while, and so these examples from these church history stories, I think they're encouraging. I think they're fun, um, and I I think there there's a lot of good ones, and also there's a lot of sad ones too. There are people who get married, their wife or their husband dies young, and they just kind of J C Ryle. He loved his wife, loved his second wife, and then he just kind of was like, ah, I'm not getting married. Again. Alexander White, oh man, he loved his wife, had four kids, I believe it was. She died, and he was just like, I can't get married again. I loved her too much. I can't do it again. And uh, Felix Carey, out on the mission field, lost his wife and his baby son 
And he almost went crazy. He went and built a log cat, like a cabin in the woods. And people were like, if you stay out there by yourself, the tigers will you. And he was just basically like, yep, that's kind of the plan. And he spent 40 days out there wrestling with that. It just, just there are some hard stories, but I think marriage is such an important part of our lives. And, and to people who don't get married and they say, oh, I haven't found anybody. I'm not, there are single people throughout church history as well. So you're not alone. Um, but I think it's just such a big deal to people's lives. And yet I think it's not something that, Sometimes it always gets covered directly. So that's why I thought this would be a good episode uh, to do with you, Joel. I like it. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of Revived Conversations. And if you need more love advice from oh, Troy no. and Joel, feel free to write in and tell us what you're going through with your spouse. Yeah, and <laughs> I will not sign up for that show. You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to, that's for the new one. We're church history dating. I want, I want people, I want jazz tune no. intro, the whole cheesy nineties vibe. And I want, I want people writing and be like, so my spouse, you know, she doesn't help with the dish. That's what yeah. There's things in life that I will not attempt to, to pretend to be and a marriage counselor is definitely one of them yeah yeah i will co-sign that that's not what we're here for hopefully this was helpful though all right that's gonna do it for this episode uh and until next time uh have a great day this is troy and joel and you were listening to revive thoughts revive thoughts